question. Oh. All right. So we're ready to go. Um, sorry for the delay, uh, some technical difficulties. The chair notes the time is 6-12. I call this meeting of the Amherst Zoning Board of Appeals to order. My name is Steve Judge. As chair of the ZBA, I want to welcome everyone to this, this public meeting. We'll begin with the roll call of ZBA members. Steve Judge is present. Mr. Craig Meadows, I can see he's there. We'll wait for his present. <laughs> he's present. Mr. Henry? Here. Mr. Philip White? Here. Mr. David Solberger? Here. Ms. Hilda Greenbaum? Here. Mr. John Varner? Here. And Mr. David Alfeld? <laughs> David, all right, he's here, as well as Ms. Rizwana yes. Khan. Yeah, hello. Hello. <laughs> the quorum is present. Also attending the public meeting tonight is uh, Christine Brestrup, Planning Director for the town. Um, we will be joined by Carolyn Murray from KP Law, who is of counsel to us, and Pam Field Sandler, who helps us with uh, um, administrative. She's been just, <laughs> she's done a lot of stuff as well with administrative stuff for the, for the CBA. Pursuant to Chapter 20 of the Acts of 2021 and extended by Chapter 2 of the Acts of 2023, this meeting will be conducted via remote means. Members of the public who wish to observe the meeting may do so via Zoom or by telephone. No in-person attendance of members of the public will be permitted, but every effort will be made to ensure that the public can adequately access the proceedings in real time via technological means. The Zoning Board of Appeals is a quasi-judicial body that operates under the authority of Chapter 48 of the General Laws of the Commonwealth with the purpose of promoting the health, safety, and convenience and general welfare of the inhabitants of the town of Amherst. In accordance with the provisions of Massachusetts General Laws Chapter 48 and Article 10, Special Permit Granting Authority of the Amherst Zoning Bylaw, this public meeting has been duly advertised and notice thereof has been posted and mailed to parties of interest. All hearings and meetings are open to the public and are recorded by town staff and may be viewed via the Town of Amherst YouTube channel and ZBA webpage. Tonight's agenda is a roll call. Um, discussion items include um, election of officers, a discussion of professionalism, a discussion regarding open meeting law and conflicts of interest presented by Carolyn Murray at KP Law, a discussion of functions of the board and other administrative matters not listed. That will be followed by other business not anticipated within the last 48 hours and adjournment. Um, before we begin to the first item on the agenda, I want to do a couple of things. Um, First, I want to, especially for our newest members, I want to thank you for agreeing to serve on the ZBA. Uh, I think you'll know from our, exist, our current members, uh, they have been very, they've been valuable, they've done, taken a lot of, they've worked hard, they've taken a lot of time for this, but this requires a commitment of, of time and a desire to try to serve the town, and doing so, you're volunteering to spend this time serving on this body is, uh, is is welcome and I want to thank you for that. I've enjoyed alert, I've enjoyed my time on the board, I've learned a lot, and I'm sure that you will as well. Secondly, I want to note that we have really good and hardworking staff that supports us. Ms. Brestra, Ms. Field Sadler, and a new staffer who's, um, who will be joining us later, uh, Janita Williams, is a new planner that joined the, the, the staff recently as well as Rob Mora, all do a great job for us. And quite frankly, we couldn't do our job without them. So I'd encourage you to, to use the staff to educate yourself. If you have questions, uh, feel free to contact them, get to, get to know the staff, get to use them. They are really, really helpful and, we have, and they work really, really hard for us. So we couldn't do our job without them. Lastly, I'd just like to say a couple of things before we start the meeting. One thing I think that's important that we all remember is that for many people who are appearing before the ZBA, this is the most important interaction they will have with, the, with their government. It deals with the value of their home. It deals with the quality of life in their neighborhood. It deals with their, um, the, the value and success of their business. It can be with the, it deals with the everyday aspects of their life all the time. And I think it's really important that we give the impression as a, as a public body that we are 
consider we are giving them full consideration for what they they are before us that we're dealing with in a professional and um, a professional manner that everybody who comes before us will feel that they have been given a fair shot that the rules were applied fairly and that they may not get everything they, they ask for or that they seek, but that they were treated fairly and that the process worked. That is, that is I think, the most important thing. I think that's important for the, the um, credibility of the town. It's important for us to be seen as a credible body that makes its decisions based on the rules and regulations of the board and within the zoning bylaw. So I think it's important to create a really good impression of our process. And I, wa I want to also say that I think it's really important that each of you feel that you've been treated fairly, that you're given a chance to comment, to contribute, that you all have an opportunity to do so, and that the process does not exclude anybody in this uh, on the board, and that we value each of your comments and your contributions greatly. So that, those are the, the key things that I care about as, chair, as, as the current chair of the board, and I hope that we continue to, to do that going forward. Those are what those are sort of the principles that I I think are most important. And we're going to discuss a little bit more about that later in the in the meeting. But I just wanted to set the stage for what I think are some of the most important things and aspects of this of the ZBA and of public service, quite frankly. So the first thing we're going to talk about tonight is uh, I would like to do just a real brief introduction of uh, especially for the for the benefit of the new members and the benefit of the current members for the new members that are that are coming on i'd like to just do a really brief introduction so we know have something about each other and so i'll start and then literally it's it's short and, and sweet i moved to town about 10 years ago i've been on the, somebody suggested i take this um take on the volunteer for the zba i'm not talking to them anymore after doing that um, <laughs> but i joined the board as an associate as an associate member uh, and have been on the board since about 2017. I came from Washington, D.C., where I worked in and around government for 40 years, and we retired up here. My wife and I have, uh, live up here, and I have a daughter in, in uh, Connecticut and a son in Massachusetts. That's my basic um, bio. Mr. White, can you give us yours real briefly? Absolutely. Uh, and yeah, welcome to the new members. My name is Philip White. Uh, for my midlife crisis, I decided to go to college. Uh, so I am at Amherst College. Um, and love serving on the ZBA. Is that brief enough? That's brief enough. Mr. Sloviter, can you do the same thing? Now that I've unmuted myself, I can. I moved here in 2010 from Philadelphia. I live in Amherst, and I have been on the ZBA as an associate and a full member for three years and have found it very rewarding and I'm um, looking forward to continuing to make a contribution to the town. Thank and I try to be as brief as Philip, and I have no idea if I, if I succeeded. He you did very well. Mark. Yeah. <laughs> you, did, you, of course, did very well. <laughs> Mr. Henry? Thank you, Mr. Judge. Hi, everyone. My name is Everald Henry. I moved to Amherst in 2016, and I'm a practice an attorney on the recommendation of a judge that I practice in front of, I joined the ZBA, and this is my first full year. And Mr. Meadows. Uh, I'm Craig Meadows. I moved back into the area in 1969. Um, I've been hanging around here for a while. Uh, at one point I started a, uh, founded a, a small thing called the Yellow Sun Natural Foods Co-op. Um, which I ran for a number of years. Uh, I now have an energy um, conservation company. Most of the work we do is uh, federal and also in New York City. Uh, as you can see, I spend time out of Amherst quite a bit. Uh, and I'm in Colombia at the moment. Great. Thank you. Mr. Alfeld, can you just give us a brief? Uh, so, yes. Okay. Thank you. Well, it's, it's good to meet you all and um, I'm good to be here. Um, my wife and I have lived in Amherst at the same house for 35 years. Um, I retired about five years ago from UMass where I was on the faculty at in the Department of Civil and Environmental Engineering. My uh, areas of interest uh, 
teaching expertise are uh, water related, groundwater, um, stream flow, water contamination, um, drainage, things of that nature. So uh, look forward to the opportunity to serve. Another one of our current associate members, Ms. Greenbaum, can you just give us a brief? brief oh, background? yeah, I've got a whole litany here. I came in 1954 as a freshman at Mount Holyoke, worked three summers on Air Force grants on visual perception, and then left to go to Columbia for a few years, but um, got married in between. My field is neuroscience, how the ear works, and I've been following land use since around 1980, the, the, the particularly planning board and zoning board for the League of Women Voters. And let's see, I was put on the board when? Around 2004, Chris? 2005, something like that. And then uh, my term, I had put eight years then, and then I saw when I was covering this meeting for the um, uh, almost indie that you were sh short on help. And I says, I can help. And I guess beside land use, the other thing is I had a husband who was a city boy and he came from the Midwest and he decided that a good summer occupation for him was collecting or, or saving old houses. Like some people save cats, he saved old houses. So he sort of got into the historic preservation through the back door. And that's what I do. Thank you, Ms. Greenbaum. Mr. Varner? I've lived in Amherst since uh, 1994. And uh, my wife and I <laughs> have a daughter who is just, uh, she graduated Amherst High in 2010 and then uh, is wrapping up her work as a PhD now. Um, I've had a really uh, varied employment experience. Uh, I worked for several years with the National Park Service. I worked at a startup biotech that Ms. Greenbaum knows uh, Ecoscience. Yep. Uh, I was employee number 13 in the door there and uh, stayed with them until they got too big too fast and fell apart. And at that point, I became uh, an acupuncturist full time. Mm -hmm. uh, I am partially retired now. Um, I worked for 20 years at Bay State Hospital's Pain Management Center. Um, and um, I got an interest in Amherst politics a few years back when the house across the street became a student rental and uh, several problems spun out of that and that inspired me to get involved in uh, what's going on in town. Great. Thank you, Mr. Varner. And uh, Ms. Khan, you'll be, um, your term will begin in July, on July 1st. So thank you for joining us. And, and as a soon to be member, can you just give us a bit of background? Oh, you're muted. Yeah, you're muted. Good. All right. Thank you so much for uh, having me in your panel. It's uh, just my honor because I see all of you and you're mm -hmm. contributing so much. I do not have that of a technical uh, kind of a experience, but I have been living in really uh, populated and big towns and cities, basically very metropolitan. I was in California for 18, 19 years. Then I went to Pakistan. Uh, for uh, some time. So I've seen a lot of um, progress and the progress brings lots of um, challenges. And in Amherst, I see there's this struggle going on and I am an advocate also. I, I work in the local um, uh, Amherst Pelham Regional School District. So, and, and I'm involved in lots of other causes also. So I firsthand have seen what happens. And so I just am very, I feel, for um, this um, place and I take the ownership and I want to um, educate. And because Steve Judge, I have heard so uh, good of you because in my interview also I've said that uh, um, collaboration and uh, sitting down as a you know community is very important if we want to resolve things because this is a very tricky situation that we are finding ourselves in right now because of so many complexities. Basically, thank you again so much. Thank you, Ms. Khan. Mm -hmm. And um, Ms. Brestra, do you want to just give us a background on your, on your, uh, on you as well as your your 
your role here for the ZBA? Sure. I'm Chris Brestrup. I'm the planning director. I went to UMass and studied landscape architecture and got a master's degree there a long time ago. And I practiced landscape architecture for a number of years. And then um, we started to adopt children. We adopted two children from India and we moved back to Amherst and I pieced together a living teaching and doing uh, a little bit of landscape architecture. But then I was hired by the town of Amherst in 2003 in the planning department and I worked my way up and now I'm planning director. And it's my pleasure to work with the public and to serve the people of Amherst and try to figure out what the best thing to do is for the people of Amherst. So I'm very happy to be working with you. And um, Pam is certainly my right-hand person and just does everything so well. And um, she volunteered to take over this meeting tonight. So we're really thrilled to have her here. Um, I'm sure you want to hear from him what her story is. <laughs> My story is so long. Ms. Fields Adler, can you, uh, I, I apologize. You, we don't see you very often, but I know you do a lot of work with the planning board as well. So I do. I do. Sure. I came to the town of Amherst from the town of Hatfield in 2008. I came um, and worked in the health department. From the health department, I came on over to the town hall where I currently work primarily as support for the planning board. But in this little interim, this month of May, I have hunted and done all kinds of different things, including um, coming and visiting you folks with the ZBA. So thank you for having me and being patient with me. Thank you for pitching in. Okay. All right. Um, the first order of business on tonight's agenda is election of officers. It's requirement of election of officers. Can, I'm getting some is feedback. That, yeah. Yeah. yeah, sound it's is getting bad again. The first order of business tonight is uh, election of officers. Under the rules and regulations of the ZBA, we're required to do this every year. Um, I've talked with a couple of members of, of the several members of the board, existing members of the board, and um, I think there's a, a, a slate of candidates for election that, of officers. That would include me continuing as chair, Mr. Meadows um, as vice chair, and Mr. Henry as uh, clerk. Um, other nominations are in order, um, but I would entertain a motion that we, that, we um, nom that, that slate be nominated and then if, if another, other people wish to to run, they may do so, or if they wish to modify that slate, that would be available. So moved. Is there a, so on this case, I have to say that in this case, only regular members can vote. So, um, to the, so it's the five regular members can vote. Associate members can express their opinion, but only the five regular members can vote. Can I second the motion or no? No, but... Um, okay. Okay. But you can, you can, well, we'll take that as a positive thing, Ms. Greenball. Yes. <laughs> Mr. Slover. I'm happy to, um, to make that motion. Is there a second? I will second. Mr. White seconds. Is there any discussion? If not, are there any other nominations? If not, the vote occurs on the motion to have the slate of Myself as chair, Mr. Meadows as vice chair, and Mr. Henry as clerk. Um, this requires a roll call vote. The chair votes aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Sloviter? Aye. Mr. White? Aye. All right, motion carries. Second order of business is professionalism. Um, it's just a discussion of generally what is important. I kind of hit on it at the, at the beginning of the of the, the meeting, and I just think it's important that the board present a professional meet a demeanor to the public. I mean, I think it it helps to give us credibility that we take this job seriously, that we give everybody a fair shake. And I, and, and I know each of you received something from um, Chris called the Riggins Rules. And I found this, I went to a training session, this was handed out. You know, I think it has some very valuable points. It's dated, quite frankly. I think it's probably 25 or 30 years old. 
it's not quite as old to be called quaint yet, but there are things there that I don't think are really up to date in, in the modern world. But it, it contains some really good ideas. And I'm just going to create a couple, I'm just going to highlight a couple of things and I'd ask you to take a look at it on your own. The first thing is to create a good impression of city government. I think that's important. The second thing is to try to be on time uh, for meetings. I think it shows that you, that you care about the, 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 uh, the process enough that you'll make sure that you can be on time. And I'd even ask you if you could come into the meeting about 10 minutes early. So if there are any questions, if there are any problems with, with connections, we can get those resolved. And so we don't have the, we don't have to delay starting the meeting, but being on time, I think is important. Two things that I think really are important and that you're going to, as new members, I think are, it's going to be difficult because people are going to seek you out is one is we don't have in-person meetings right now, but I think in, if we ever do, it's important not to sort of get the impression that you have a view given a set view of the, of the items to be discussed that night before the meeting begins. So don't sort of hang out with friends or people that look to be of a particular have a particular view on issues before you, you don't want to give the impression that you've made up your mind already. So it's just, that's a case when in-person meetings, but in your day-to-day -day life, you're going to be asked by people, they're going to come up to you and say, I know you're on a ZBA, XYZ is coming up before us, before you, and I really think that's an awful or it's a great idea. And what happens to me, when that happens to me, I tend to say to somebody, that's right, that is coming up before us, I can't really talk to you about that. I can't really hear from you about that. And if you want me to be on, if you want me to be on that panel, then it's a good idea for you to stop talking about that right now, because my job requires me to be to come in with an open view, and that's really important. You're going to learn more about the open meeting law and other things from Carolyn Murray, but that is something that just happens. People are going to want to talk to you, and quite frankly, you really shouldn't be talking about a specific case. That doesn't mean that you can't be involved in town politics. You can't be involved in. You can't have opinions, you can't state opinions on general issues, but cases that you know are going to be before the board on which on a panel on which you're going to serve, you should not be discussing that with other people um, outside of, or other board members outside of the public meeting. And that's just, that's the state open meeting law and that's important to know. And I think each of you will probably have that situation arise uh, as you are, um, as you are members of the board. One of the other things are, is this board requires a lot of work, uh, quite frankly. There's, we get a lot of paper, we get a lot of, of uh, applications, and a good board member and a, and a contributing board member is somebody that will, go, will take the time to go through that, all the meeting material ahead of time so that you are knowledgeable when the, when the meeting happens and that, you, and that you participate in the site visit if you're on that panel, if you can. Or if you can't participate at that time and we try to schedule it so that it's a time that's convenient for everybody, that you'll take it the make an effort to go out and look at the property itself. Um, so read the material if you can. If you have questions about the material, the staff is there to help you understand it. Um, they do a very good job with the with the draft public project application report, which is kind of your bible for each of the applications that we're going to see. That is a good um, document that helps that runs through the decision, the, not only the history but the decision tree that you have to make on whether you can approve this on the disposition of the special permit or variance or um, reconsideration of a building commissioner's decision. Those are things that are really helpful. And then it's really helpful just to see the physical property that is being um, about which the application is, is raised. It's just really helpful to get a sense of it. And so I'd encourage you, if you can't make the site visit, to at least drive by and take a look at, at, the, at the site itself. Um, only once have I felt that we had a situation where board members were not acting in a manner with each other that I thought was appropriate. And that happened, it's only happened once in the nine years or six years, I've been, eight years I've been on the board. And it's just not something that I, that I as a chairman will tolerate, or I think anybody who is a chairman will tolerate. We, we deal with each other in a professional, courteous manner. We understand that people have differences of views. We don't categorize their differences as to demean them or to, uh, to, or to uh, question their motives. And that's just not something that can be done and have a collegial body that works well. It's only happened once. I don't anticipate it would happen, but, and it's not very, uh, it's not consistent with the sort of way in which we do things in Amherst here. But I think 
it's good to be reminded of that. What is a challenge is that sometimes the public will not, will not, or the or an applicant will not be as um, discerning in their comments. They have a right to say what they want to say, and we really can't we can't shut them down for being offensive. But if they break the rules of the of the of the of the, um, of the zoning board of appeals, where they're given they exceed their amount of time. They don't talk about the issue before us. The chair has the ability and the prerogative to, to end their um, comments at that point. So if somebody's angry, they can express it from a point of view, from the public standpoint about us and about our decisions. We have to live with that, but they don't have to, and they can, it can even be somewhat offensive, but we don't have the ability to stop them from expressing their point of view unless they're violating the rules of the of the committee and that mostly is a time limit and speaking on the matter before us. Um, lastly, well, that's, I think those are the big, the, the, the um, oh, there's two others, two other issues here in the ratings rules that I'd like to highlight. I think the staff does a really great job. They've spent a lot of time, they have a lot of expertise, they have a lot of knowledge about the issues before us and they have spent time with the applicant and with people who are concerned about it before it comes to the board. And so I don't think we take the recommendations of the staff lightly. We don't have to rubber stamp that. We are here as a board to make our decisions. The staff makes a recommendation. It's up to us to make a, to, to vet, to a, make a judgment on that recommendation. But I take the, the recommendations of the board with them, of the staff pretty seriously and I give it a hard look. But it, there is, we do have discretion about that. It's, we are not a rubber stamp for the staff, but I, I have to tell you, there's not a lot of occasions. There, there are some occasions where I disagree, but for the most part, I think the staff recommendations have been well thought out and they're guidance for us. And we can, we can build our decisions based on that and we can move on from there. And lastly, um, if you got a question, I, I really do want to tell you that I, I think the uh, call, call Chris, call Rob Mora, talk to them about the issues but before the committee, before you, um, or call, and if it's not a specific case, you can talk to me, but not on a certain matter that's before the board. If, you're, if you have a concern about a process or procedure, or you have a question about, of your role, that's something I can help you with or Chris can help you with. But don't call, don't call each other and don't call me if you have a question about a specific application, because then we're violating the open meeting law. Those are, you can find most of that stuff in this Riggins rules. It's helpful. As I said, it's 25 years old. I'm not going to tell people how to dress. I'm not going to tell them other kinds of things that are taken up in this 40-year-old um, document. But the core of that document makes sense. And just give it a read. I think I have full confidence that every one of us is going to be good on this and we're going to have a great board going forward. It always has been. And I look forward to working with all of you. If there's a question this about professional demeanor, about how we handle things, this is a good time to ask that. Um, we can go on and talk about other, um, other topics on the agenda. But the first one is professional demeanor. Um, you know, Second item is positive communication and behavior with applicants, board members, staff, and the public. We've touched on that, but it also it's important not to be adversarial in these hearings as a board member, adversarial with the, with the applicants. You can question them. You can disagree with them. I mean, your, your, your decision may be, not be the one that they want to hear, but being as, as um, non-emotional and non-confrontational as possible, is a better way to run, is a better way to have a question or to conduct yourself rather than being aggressive and, and adversarial in a meeting. It just, I, it, it works better, you get more information, and I think you're seen as a better board member if you do, do it that way. So I encourage that as a, as a sort of a rule. Um, and the second point, the third point is refraining from committing critical comments or value judgments. That's harder to do, but um, critical comments, you may think that something isn't, isn't right or isn't, they, haven't, they haven't stated the facts correctly. It isn't a critical comment to disagree with that, but to go after somebody for um, 
that their motive for doing that, that's kind of a critical comment. I would say value judgments are probably should be left to your decision. When we're talking with each other in the public meeting, public hearing is a time when you interact with the applicants and the public. Public meeting is when we discuss it amongst ourselves. That's when you can express your value judgments. That's when you can, we talk about what we feel is the right decision. That's when we express our opinions. And I think that's a better place to have that discussion because that's then the discussion among us as board members. We've talked about respective, respectful behavior. And lastly, training opportunities. Chris, you can talk about this, but there are some really good training opportunities that are available to you as a member of the ZBA. I found them helpful when I first came on the board. I did a couple of them. I traveled to um, uh, Holy Cross, I think, for one, and I've done one, a couple online. I think they're important, they're helpful. There's a lot of, lot of um, information that you can gather in that way, and I would encourage you, if you have the time and the opportunity, to take up some of the, the training opportunities that the, the town offers. And Chris, can you, is there any to talk about? Uh, that's, yeah, that's um, it, it comes through as the Citizens Planner, the Citizen Planners Training Collaborative, and it's um, a function of UMass Extension Service. And every year they hold a, um, a meeting in Worcester at Holy Cross, as, as Mr. Judge said, and it's a, a whole day. And I've been to it numerous times. Pam has been to it uh, at least once, maybe more. Um, but it explains what is the role of the Zoning Board of Appeals? What is the role of the Planning Board? What's the role of zoning? Um, it, lots of different things that are potentially new to some of you. And so um, we encourage people to attend that meeting. It's usually in March. I think it's usually the middle Saturday in March. So it's, you know, usually there isn't any snow, although Hilda and I did manage to get into a snowstorm one time. Um, but in any event, it's definitely worthwhile. And they also offer online um, courses. So we encourage you to sign up for those. There is some money in the planning department budget to reimburse people. We don't have a lot of money, but if you, um, you know, spend $35 or $50 signing up for a course, um, let me know and I can uh, reimburse you, you know, have, have the town send you a check for that. Um, what else? I, I think I think that's it. Um, and anytime that there's a training that we think would be worthwhile for you, we'd uh, send it off to you, forward it to you. So, so that's, uh, yeah, that's good, a good idea. Great. Thank you, Ms. Brestro. Um, is there any questions on sort of that second item on the agenda, which is writ large professionalism, but dealing with um, process or anything that you, that especially the new members have? Oh, Ms. Presta. I just wanted to note that Ms. Khan had to leave early. She left at about 6.30 um, because she had um, a conflict with another meeting. So don't think she's not interested. She is very interested and she just had to go off to another meeting. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I guess the next thing is to, is to bring in Carolyn um, to talk about of open meeting law and conflict of interest. And as we do that, I, I'd remind the new members that um, you have to complete trainings on ethics. And, and if you haven't done that, um, you, there's a training um, course that you have to take. And there's some forms you have to sign certifying that you understood the conflicts of interest in the open meeting law. And then you have to be signed in at the or sworn in at the clerk's office. So before you can be on a panel, make sure you do that. And if you have any questions, um, you can talk to Ms. Brestup and that can be arranged. Mr. Alfeld. Yeah, I just wanted to mention that, um, well, first of all, I appreciate all your comments uh, on professionalism that are very clear. And I wanted to mention that there was a training next week that um, I signed up for it. it uh, Ms. Brestrup, Brestrup uh, sent out the notice for it. And I think it's title, like I was looking for it, but I can't find it. I think it's title is something like uh, how to make decisions without putting yourself in legal jeopardy. Something that's not quite the title, but that's the gist of it, which looked kind of interesting. So I, I imagine there's still opportunities to sign up for that. Great. Thank you.
Excuse me, may I just say something about that? Unfortunately, we had to submit um, what we call carry forwards for our budget. And so we've submitted all of our carry forwards. Anybody who has told me that they wanted to sign up for something, we've included um, reimbursement of those people in our carry forwards. But if someone were to sign up after now, um, we would not be able to reimburse them because the town doesn't know that it's on, it's not on the carry forward list. So you're welcome to sign up, but I'm afraid by this time you would have to pay for yourself. Okay. All right. Um, you ready? Let's bring in, in Ms. Murray. Hello, Ms. Murray. Good evening, Mr. Chair. How are you? I'm great. How are you? Good. Good. We've got a full. We've got a full group here for you tonight. Um, and if I may, I just want to let everybody know that Attorney Murray is with the KP Law Firm. She's been. Uh, she's helped us out on an outside counsel basis on a couple of different matters. She's very extremely knowledgeable on matters of ZBA and related matters, uh, especially on 40B. We used her quite a bit to help us not only navigate that, but to provide our decisions and right conditions. And she's been, she's a great help. So, um, and I'd ask you not only to talk about the open meeting along conflict of interest, but also if you, at the end of that, if you could kind of um, transition into talking about the, how we are an interpretive body that we have sort of, that the zoning bylaw is, gives us some room to, to make decisions, but we have to do that within what's allowed by the law. So we are interpreting rather than legislating. And if you just kind of go through that at the end of your presentation, that'd be, a little, that'd be helpful as well. Certainly, and if I forget by the time we get there, Mr. Chair, please remind me. Do. <laughs> um, so uh, as the chair said, thank you for that kind introduction and for those that I haven't met before, um, welcome to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Um, I was listening in um, on part of the, the meeting from the beginning, and um, I know that there were a lot of things that the chair has already covered. I'm going to go into a little bit more detail on some of those things, but um, I think we're going to cover some pretty good ground. Um, I will say that when we do these trainings, um, we could spend easily an hour on the open meeting law or the conflict of interest law. And I'm not suggesting that that means everybody look at your watches because we're gonna be here till nine o'clock this evening. I'm, I'm not. Um, I've kind of uh, condensed the overall training this evening with an eye towards just focusing on what it is that board members need to know. There are certainly elements of both statutes that um, it's more important for staff folks to know, um, but in the interests of, of, of time um, and really what pertains most to you as board members, I'll just focus on that. Um, one other thing is you, since you were just talking about training opportunities, um, our firm has participated in the Citizens Planning Training Collaborative We've also been invited by a number of like regional planning committees from time to time to go and cover certain topics. So uh, I hear that uh, the budget money for remaining for the rest of this year might be a little bit tight. I will also let you all in on a secret that might not be widely um, advertised uh, through the town manager's office. And that is that we offer two free trainings per year to all of our clients. And so if you folks decided, look, we really do need to have um, like an introduction to the zoning mm -hmm. bylaw or, um, you know, we've done the 40B training in the past when it had been a period of time since anyone had had one of those. Um, even I think so I'll felt the, the topic, if I recall, is drafting, like making and drafting defensible decisions is typically the the topic that I think uh, you're, you're referring to. Um, 
We've done all of those in the past. I've done many of them. We would be happy to share any materials with you. We'd also be happy at any given time if you really think that, gee, uh, we could really use um, a little overview on something like this. We're happy to work with you and uh, save your budget uh, a little bit of money in the process. Um, one other thing too, is that as we start to get underway, um, my preference with any kind of a training is to recognize that this is for your benefit. It is not for mine. So if there's anything that I say that doesn't make sense to you, or uh, you're not quite sure whether you heard me correctly, or there's a situation in your mind that you've encountered previously and you think, hmm, that doesn't quite square up with what my experience has been, feel free to jump in and ask questions. Because I guarantee you that if, if you've got a question about something I just said, there's bound to be at least one other person uh, you know, amongst your colleagues here who probably has the very same question. So um, it won't throw me off track. It might uh, might extend my time limit a little bit, but I will try to keep us on a on a, on a tight leash there and come back to it. Um, so just uh, just for my own curiosity, of the new zoning board members, maybe by a show of hands, have any of you served on a board previously? Yes. Yes. Okay. Yes. Well, Hilda, I know you from the the forty B, but okay. I just uh, I've done a lot of forty Bs. I understood. Um. So, as the chair was starting to say, um, there's typically when you get um appointed or elected to a board, one of the first things you're supposed to do is obviously go in and be sworn in by the town clerk, and the town clerk is supposed to provide you with at least two key pieces of information. One is you're supposed to get your handy dandy copy of the open meeting law. And you're supposed to sign off that you have received it. And depending upon the board that you serve on, you're also supposed to get the prior five years worth of any open meeting law determinations that apply to that board so that you can have the benefit of understanding um, decisions that might have been issued prior to your becoming a member. The other thing, as Mr. Judge was saying, um, is the conflict of interest statute. You are required as a new member uh, to, I think, every two years, but certainly upon being uh, sworn into a, a new position, you're supposed to do this online training. And then at the end of it, you get a successful completion certificate that you're supposed to print out. And that's supposed to be kept on file typically with the town clerk. So if um, anyone is, has not yet made contact with the town clerk and hasn't received that, um, either of those pieces of information, please make sure that you do. Um, so I'm gonna start first with the open meeting law. And as its name suggests, uh, it applies to meetings, but meetings of whom? Meetings of public bodies. And what is a public body you are? the Zoning Board of Appeals, the Planning Board, the Conservation Commission, any multi-member board that carries out some sort of function of the town is a public body. So you are all subject to the open meeting law. And what is the behavior that the open meeting law governs? Well, as the name implies, meetings. So what is a meeting? A meeting is literally defined as any type of communication amongst a quorum of any board about any matter that is within your jurisdiction. So typically, for example, if you have a five member board, I know we have some associate members here, but if we're dealing with just uh, say the permanent members of a board, if you've got a five member board, anytime three members of that board communicate that is and, and, and communicate not about the weather or do we think the Celtics are going to sweep, but communicate about some sort of matter that is either before you or likely to come before you, that constitutes a meeting. So I want you to bear that, the, that kind of core idea in mind that if you run into some folks at the farmer's market, 
or even as the the chair was saying at the in his introductory remarks that you know you run into people at chant social occasions all the time you could run into folks at the hallway uh, a town hall while you're all getting sworn in you shouldn't discuss any business that is either pending or might come before you because there's the the, the potential that that could be perceived as a meeting of the board and you can only meet as a board when you actually publicly post your meetings pursuant to the open meeting law. So I'm gonna go through that um, in a little bit more detail. So the open meeting law requires that every single one of your meetings have to be, there has to be public notice. And how do we provide that public notice? We post it. And where do we post it? Well, in the, I'm old enough to remember the good old days when there always used to be, uh, good old fashioned, you know, bulletin board outside of the town clerk's office and folks would just come up with their thumbtacks and stick their meeting notice in. Now we're a little bit more savvy. We use websites and they we have electronic calendars, but we still have to post notices of our meetings. And it isn't just that um, we post that we're going to have a meeting. We have to post all of the items that we expect we are going to discuss at that meeting. So when do you have to post notice? Now, for the most part, this is really going to pertain to staff and or the chair, because by the open meeting law, the chair and or the staff actually prepare the meeting notice. But no meeting notices have to be posted 48 weekday hours prior to your meeting. So Saturday, Sundays and legal holidays do not count. So if you've got a meeting on Monday night, you need to make sure that it is posted wherever your official meeting uh, posting location is by Thursday. And they really do mean 48 hours. So we can't post Thursday at 3 p.m. for a Monday at 2 p.m. meeting. We've really got to make sure we've got the 48 hours in there. Um, we need to make sure that we tell people not just who is going to meet, but where are we going to meet? So if we were actually meeting in a particular conference room at town hall, we would put the name and address of that conference room if it has a name or the room number, whatever it happens to be. Um, if you look at the agenda for, for example, for tonight's meeting, since we're meeting remotely, we have all of the Zoom link information there as well. Where you, look, where you meet also must be ADA accessible. So anyone who might have some kind of a, a mobility issue, uh, we need to make sure that they can get to the physical meeting location. If you know in advance, for example, that um, if uh, someone is um, confined to a wheelchair and is coming to a physical meeting at town hall and, an and your meeting was supposed to be on the third floor and the elevator is out of service, you have got to move that meeting somewhere where that person can get access to it. Similarly, if you know that there is uh, someone who might be hard of hearing, or if you know that you might be in need of an interpreter, we need to make arrangements to make sure that means are, uh, you know, we accommodate that, that need and we can come up with some sort of a hearing device or an interpreter to help everyone have access to the meeting. Now your meeting itself will typically fall into like one of two categories. It's either an open session or what we call executive session. Open session is going to be for a zoning board of appeals. It's going to be 99% of your business. And what do I mean by that? Most of your applications are always going to require a public hearing. So we're going to advertise that public hearing um, pursuant to chapter 40A, which is a whole different means of providing notice in addition to the open meeting law. Um, and we're going to describe the property. We're going to identify the property by its address. That's the subject of the application. We'll probably identify the applicants themselves and we'll give a brief um, description of what is the nature of the relief. Are they applying for a variance to encroach into a side yard setback, for example? Um, so that the purpose being 
you want to look at the perspective uh, from the reasonable member of the public. You know, could a member of the public pick up a copy of your meeting notice, look at it, and reasonably understand what the board was going to discuss that evening? If they had, you're, you've got a very sufficiently um, noticed public meeting, because that is one of the things the Attorney General's Office will also look for is the sufficiency of the notice. Did you provide enough detail so that someone knows what's being discussed? Executive session is um, another is sort of a fancy word for closed session, meaning when the board can literally meet behind closed doors, you know, with no members of the public other than those that you might invite in to attend. Um, in my experience with zoning boards, there aren't a lot of opportunities for executive sessions, so I won't spend too much time on this. I think the only purpose for an executive session that might um, you might have occasion to experience is going to be litigation. You know, you you issue a decision, whether it's an approval or a denial of someone's application, someone appeals that to court. Now we're in a position where we might need to come back at some point and provide you with an update on the litigation, or maybe even talk about a potential settlement or you know some other type of legal strategy. That would be an occasion for us to go into executive session and talk privately amongst ourselves about that litigation. Um, one other component of the open meeting laws that you're required to, um, you'll see in future meetings that uh, you're required to approve minutes. So regardless of whether you are in an open session or you are in executive session, minutes must be taken of the meeting. The minutes, do not need to be a transcript of what everyone said. It just has to be a fair summary of what was discussed. And you have to identify who was present. You have to also make sure that you clearly state every motion that was made and votes that were taken. You're also supposed to approve your minutes within every three meetings or 30 days whichever is longer. Um, I have some zoning boards that really get tripped up by this because they might only meet once a month and all it takes is one illness or one vacation and the minutes get backed up and now we're, you know, in some cases, six months or more before minutes get approved. Um, if you have a uh, Someone in, in the town who likes to file open meeting law complaints, as some towns do, uh, you could find yourself vulnerable to an open meeting law complaint for simply not approving your minutes in a timely manner. And we'll talk about what that process looks like a little bit later, but bear that in mind to always try to be current with your, with your minutes. I have um, a, a quick question. Yeah, sure. you. Yeah. One of the things that comes up, people are hesitant to approve Board members are hesitant to um, vote on a motion to approve minutes if they weren't on the panel that was at that meeting. And it becomes really difficult to reconstitute the exact same panel that we had at the same, at, we had prior. Do we have to do that or can, or is it, is it okay for members to vote on the vote on approving minutes for a meeting at which they did not attend? It is perfectly okay for members to vote to approve minutes for a meeting that they were not in attendance at. You know, the Thank approval you. of minutes is really nothing much more than a ministerial act of the board. And if we think about it, um, you know, if we if we were an, if we were dealing with an elected board, for example, and let's suppose it, there was a great deal of turnover from one election to the next, and there just happened to be a meeting the night before the election. Yeah. Well, those minutes obviously cannot be approved by the same people who constituted the board at the time because maybe they weren't reelected or maybe they chose not to seek reelection. That doesn't mean that those minutes get, you know, held in limbo because we can't approve them because we weren't on the board or we weren't present for that meeting. Yeah. Anyone can approve the minutes. Uh, the only thing I would say in that scenario, Mr. Chair, is that um, I wouldn't expect 
that someone who was not present to be offering substantive corrections to those minutes, however. Right. Um, and, and, and let us not forget, I mean, you know, we, we are now dealing with the world of Zoom and things are being recorded. Um, so even if you weren't on the board or you weren't present for that particular meeting, there's a way to go back and see what was discussed and make sure that the minutes accurately reflect that discussion such that folks do not need to shy away from, um, you know, approving the minutes for on the basis of an absence or anything like that. Great, thank you. Sure. Um, one thing I also want to just touch upon is this um, idea of a meeting and a quorum of the board. It doesn't just have to be a physical meeting. It could also be um, an email transmission. It could be social media. It could be posting something on Facebook and entering into that that fray or the or blogs, et cetera. If one member of the board sends an email to the rest of the board and that email expresses any kind of an opinion position, or uh, feelings with respect to an application that is pending before you, that one single email sent to a quorum of the board is a violation of the open meeting law. There used to be sort of a rule of thought that, well, if nobody responded to that email, it was all fine. That is really not the case. <laughs> and the attorney general has actually ruled that all it takes is one person to express an opinion on a matter to come before you. And that in and of itself is um, a deliberation on a matter before you outside of a pu public meeting and therefore um, not um, in compliance with the open meeting law. Another thing is that those conversations or those communications could be serial in nature. So for example, if one member of the board ran into another member of the board again, in the you know halls of town hall and um, made some sort of a comment to the other one about, my goodness, did you get a copy of that traffic report? Boy, oh boy, there's no way in the world I can see that we're ever going to be able to, um, you know, properly mitigate that project given those traffic counts. Those two people by themselves, if you're a member of a five member board, that's not a quorum. That's not a violation of the open meeting law. But now those two people leave town hall and one of them engages in an email exchange with another board member or another one uh, you know, goes to the farmer's market and runs into somebody else at the farmer's market. And now we repeat that conversation that occurred in the halls of town hall, or we have a further communication about that traffic report. We now have serial communications that when you add up how many people have now been involved, it's more than a, it's a quorum of the board. That is also a violation of the open meeting law. A little harder to prove some of those, but there are those folks who are walking through the halls of town hall. They know who some of their members of boards happen to be. Um, and they're watching for this kind of behavior or even as you had said earlier, Mr. Chair, that sometimes it could just give off the appearance of um, some sort of improper discussion. Um, why is that important too? Is, and, and I wanna emphasize this because this is particularly important to a zoning board of appeals. And this goes a little bit, Mr. Chair, to what you asked me to add on at the end. Zoning boards of appeals are supposed to make their decisions based on the information that is presented to them in the context of a public hearing. Whether that information is you know, verbal information that is coming to you from the applicant or the applicant's representatives, whether that is in the form of documents or reports that are submitted to you, or whether that is in the form of members of the public who wish to be recognized and want to bring something to the board's attention. As long as all of that is done during, you know, within the, the, the bubble, if you will, of the public hearing, that's fine. 
because your decision ultimately you have to make findings based on what has been presented to you. But now let's go back to my traffic report scenario. Let's suppose this happened to be a particular application where for whatever reason, the applicant was not required to provide a traffic report. But neighbors were so incensed about this particular project that they took it upon themselves to commission a traffic report. But they never submit that to the board for you to consider at the public hearing. They never um, present it verbally at the to the board. But you run into someone again at town hall who says, gee, I am. I, I, I got, we, we got this traffic report and our numbers say that this is going to generate an awful lot of traffic that we just don't think that particular area of town can, can actually absorb. If that board member who maybe received that traffic report in that manner or that comment made by a particular um, you know, member of the public, if, if that then translates into when the board member votes, the board member is going to say, I'm voting against this because I don't believe that the applicant's traffic report was accurate. I happen to have information that came from some of the abutters that says just the opposite. And so I'm voting against this for that reason. You're now basing your decision on something that was not presented to the board within the context of a public hearing. And when it comes time to litigation and, and we've got to um, draft those defensible decisions, it all links back to what was the evidence that was presented to the board. So, so if somebody wants to pull you aside at, at town hall and tell you that they've privately commissioned a traffic report, I think your answer ought to be, that's fantastic. Our next hearing is Tuesday night at six o'clock. I'd encourage you to show up and provide copies of that to all of the board members. And that's your that's your way out of it right then and there. Um, another, uh, one, a couple of exceptions, however, to the whole idea of a meeting. I know I just said that, you know, um, a single communication by email from one board member to a quorum of the board is technically a deliberation which could violate the open meeting law. There are very limited exceptions to that. And um, the exceptions basically have to do with distributing a meeting agenda. So I assume you probably all got a copy of the, of the meeting for tonight by email. Distributing that or even distributing materials that perhaps would go along with any of the items on the agenda, that is perfectly fine to do. Even if it comes from the chair, and it goes to every single member of the zoning board and, and associate members as well. That does not constitute any kind of a deliberation. Now contrast that with this. The chair sends that exact same agenda and the exact same meeting materials to every single one of you, but then adds a statement that says something to the effect, I strongly recommend you take a look at that traffic report because I think this is going to be problematic for the neighbors or something to that effect. Well, now the chair has expressed an opinion to every single one of you about something that is coming before the board and that in and of itself would be considered a violation. That would be a deliberation and a violation of the open meeting law. You are also allowed to communicate with a quorum of the board for scheduling purposes. So we've all uh, seen in our world of, um, you know, hybrid or, or remote meetings, you know, how many emails does it take to schedule a meeting? You know, by the time you get done saying, how about Tuesday at five? Well, I can't do Tuesday at five, but I can do Wednesday at five. Well, I can't do Wednesday, but I can do next week. You can have a whole slew of emails back and forth with a quorum of the board copied or engaged in those exchanges, that is perfectly allowed, not a violation of the open meeting law. The one thing that might get a little bit tricky uh, for zoning board members in particular are on-site visits of um, you know any in particular place that you want to go to 
pursuant to an application. You know, you want to go, you want to get the lay of the land. You really want to see what the slope is like. You want to know where the wetlands are located. You want to get a sense of how close is this to some of the abutting properties, for example. The board is absolutely allowed to go out and do site visits. The board can also do a site visit as a board. You could also do the site visit individually if you chose to do that. But often what I see is that the board will schedule a site visit with the applicant so that everybody knows Saturday morning, nine o'clock, we're gonna go walk the site. So the question that always comes up is, does the board have to post that as a meeting or not? And my answer is a very lawyerly response, it depends. So it depends on if you're all just going to walk the site and quite literally just get the lay of the land and there is going to be no uh, deliberating amongst a quorum of the board and we're not going to have two people over here whispering and pointing and appearing to take copious notes and then a few a pocket of other folks over there also appearing to chat amongst themselves if there's any likelihood that you think that there is going to be any kind of substantive discussion besides things like where is the property line and the septic system is going to go more or less where and where is the well located can you just show me where you know how far out the extension will be if you're literally just going to get your bearings so that you have a better sense when you sit down and you're looking at the plans on paper that's fine. That is not a meeting of the board and it does not need to be posted. On the other hand, if you feel like there might be some need to go beyond that, and I know human nature is, is difficult. You know, we, we have to catch ourselves from time to time and stop ourselves from engaging in, in discussion beyond what we should. Or it may very well be that there is something that's just a little bit tricky for the board to really understand how this is all going to work on paper without actually getting a feel for it or asking the applicant, um, you know, have a little bit of back and forth with them about how, mm -hmm. uh, you know, the stormwater system is going to work or, or whatever, how much earth removal they think is going to have to take place. If you think you're going to delve into some of those things, then my recommendation is post it as a board meeting. That way there is no issue. Um, some boards you know, are always surprised when I say, you don't have to meet at town hall. You can meet anywhere you want, including at private property. Folks are usually a little bit surprised by that because that's not our normal practice. The only issue with posting that site visit as a meeting. Let's go back to my comments earlier that that meeting must be publicly accessible. So if you're going to have a public meeting, the public needs to be able to go on to that otherwise private property. So is the private property owner um, going to grant permission to all of these folks to come onto their property? That's a good question. Who knows? I have seen, and I'm sure you will see, uh, some contentious situations where a property owner will say, the board is welcome, but I do not want my next door neighbor snooping around in my backyard. Um, or accessibility. If your meeting is going to be at some property location somewhere, it still needs to be accessible to the public. So we go back to my, my hypothetical member of the public in a wheelchair. If the site is literally a construction zone that it is not safe for people or it isn't accessible. Um, one of my site visits that has always stood out in my mind um, was something pertaining to an earth removal project where someone was literally cutting into the side of a hill. And we had a site visit and we all showed up and one member of the board had recently had some sort of surgery and was um, uh, either in crutches or walking with a walker. There was no way that member of the board could even physically cross onto the property 
to really get a sense of, you know, the, the extent of the earth removal there. Things like that should go through your minds when you start to schedule site visits, because sometimes it can be very easy to say, sure, we can post it as a meeting, but if it's not going to be safe or accessible for the public, then all the more reason to say, no, this is not going to be a meeting. It will simply be a site visit. There will be no deliberation. What we will then do is at our next scheduled meeting after the site visit, if any member has any questions or wants to ask uh, something to be clarified based on something they observed at the site visit, that's the time to do it back at the, in the context of the public hearing. But it seems to me, Carolyn, one of the things that we should remember is that it's the, kind of the responsibility of the chair or, who's, or the staff who's ever leading that site visit to restrict the conversation to just the facts, ma'am. And yes. not get into, I mean, that's the way we avoid the, the question of a, a site of a public meeting. That's the way we avoid all the accessibility issues. That's the way we avoid a conflict, a, a, a challenge in court to our decision is just, just the facts, ma'am, kind of, um, for those of us old enough to remember, um, what was it, <laughs> Sergeant Friday, um, yep. and keep it to that, right? And that's Absolutely. really, what we, and that's why, and I'll say that to, to the members, and I'll, I'll get to you, David. Um, one of the things is that you, you try to keep that site visit, restrict questions restricted, and sometimes the, the staff or the chairman will say, well, that's not something we're supposed to talk about, and I don't want to, I'm not trying, and the staff is not trying to restrict you. We're just trying to protect the, the body. Yeah. yeah on a ahead. site visit, I'm sorry, th thank you. It, on a site visit, is the applicant usually there or applicant's representative? Yes. yes. In my experience, okay. yes. So, you know, I can imagine being at a site visit, and I'm a curious person, so I'm asking, you know, so how do you imagine the drainage working here? And 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 I, what I'm understanding is that that's okay to ask questions, even detailed questions. But as soon as I say, oh, geez, that might be a problem across the line. Is that? I would even recommend that I would limit the questions, not so much to how do you see the drainage working, but, you know, where will the outfall pipe be located? You know, that, you know, the, like the, the physical bearings of the, of the okay. site as reflected on the plans. The conversation that's in a nom going to normally flow from that then is really something that should be discussed in the in the public hearing because now you're raising questions about and and with the question there's a little bit of opinion or judgment that is coming through like how do you see this working you know mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. I got to tell you in my years or my experience as an engineer <laughs> blah blah blah. Water doesn't flow uphill, you know. So yeah, yeah. I, I would I would really strongly encourage, you know, take your notes and then bring it back to the next meeting and say, okay, so you know, here's what I observed, and there's this the swale and a depression and whatnot, but I really want to get a better sense. And for everybody's edif edification, how is the drainage really going to work on this site? Yeah. And and okay. to Thank to you. your to your point, Mr. Chairman, it's uh it's it's somewhat timely that you say it's the chair's responsibility. I actually had a conversation, it's the attorney general's office that enforces the open meeting law. And we have an open meeting law complaint and it's a bit contentious um, and deals with some confidential matters. And the attorney general had requested some um, some minutes be unredacted so that she could get a better sense of exactly what was the board discussing. And she repeatedly said to me, I understand that. I understand this was a heated discussion. I understand that emotions were running high, but it is the responsibility of the chair to bring everyone back to the purpose for that meeting and to remind them and, and to, you know, cut off other kinds of discussion and bring them back to where we're supposed to be. So you have very big shoes in that regard, Mr. Chair. <laughs> but, to, but to your point, you're not chastising folks. You're trying no. to just keep everyone out of trouble. Trying to protect the board. I tell you what we're going to do, Ms. Maria, we always take a five minute, this seems like a good place. We, okay. take, a five, we take a five minute break at 730 and then we come back in and, and why don't we, you know, I think we should do that now and we can come back at uh, 731 
and then we can go and talk about um, some more on the uh, um, on your presentation on the okay. conflict of interest. I think is, but I think we're getting we have a lot of good information as to what um, the the open meeting law has done, and so we'll come back and talk, finish that up, and then go on to conflict of interest, and we'll do that at seven thirty one. All right, with everybody. Yes. Great. All right. We'll see you in five.
Great. Now it's 7.32, so we can start up again. I guess I, I know you probably have a few more things to say on the open meeting law, Carolyn, but I would, I guess I, I would encourage, tell me if this is wrong, but I would just encourage members not to talk with each other, not to communicate with each other about matters the board has before it or is likely to have before it, just because of the, the possibility of the serial communication that goes on and which they can't control. You know, it, it really, it could, it happens without your knowledge. So it just is to be safe. It's best not to have that conversation and it's not normal human process. We, it's that's not how humans normally work. <laughs> we kind of, we want to try to figure something out. We want to have a sidebar conversation. Maybe we can solve this problem if we discuss it, but that's not what the law allows. And is that, would, would you say that that's common sense just to keep, keep away from having discussions about matters before the board? Absolutely. Absolutely. And it, it goes for not just, you know, the appearance of the conflict, but also every once in a while, um, board members might have a reason to attend another board's meeting and you're not oh. you certainly can attend another board's meeting and you know you, you might be invited to the planning board you might sit in on the conservation commission because you want to see what they're going to do with a project that is that is before you it's not prohibited you know, you're not prohibited from speaking at that meeting but it is always very important that you identify yourself as you know, I am so-and-so, and yes, while I am a member of the Zoning Board of Appeals, I rise tonight and I'm speaking to you as an individual. You know, I am not here representing yeah. the board. That that also sometimes, um, you know, whether you say what board you're on or whether it's just that people know what board you're on, it gives that appearance that, yes, you're having a conversation outside of the public meeting. Okay, great. Thank so, you. So with that, uh, Chair, the only thing I was just going to, to let Go folks ahead. know. You know, we have, Ms. Murray, we had a quick question. Oh, I'm sorry. Mr. Alfeld. Yeah, just uh, a quick question. I, I, I certainly understand the idea of, of avoiding conversations about topics before the board. What about topics that have been completed? It, it seemed like it might be useful to have conversations about them if the topic is, you know, settled and done and the matter if, it is is, completed. if it is absolutely settled and done and well in the rear view mirror, then it's fine to okay. discuss. But I, I have seen situations where um, it's over. You know, the board has voted. There might still be an appeal or we might be within an appeal window. Yeah. Um, or even in the context of the appeal, someone might say something like, well, you know, if I had seen that plan or if I had known that, I would have voted differently. So I, I, I always do caution folks that even though it might be something that you think is in your past, it may come back in some way, shape or form. Um, so make sure it truly is something that best. is well behind you. And one other brief question, I hope it's brief. Um, as I understand it, we are impaneled for, you know, a, a particular cases. And if we're not on that panel, do we need to be as concerned about these open meeting issues? I, I would recommend yes, because again, you are now tagged with the label of I'm on the zoning board. Um, okay. And a lot of folks in the, in the general public, they don't make a distinction between, oh, you're a voting member on the panel versus you're an alternate. Um, to them, you're all part of the board. And there's it's it kind of goes back to this whole idea of the appearance as well, that um, just because you might not be voting doesn't mean that you don't exercise perhaps some influence with the board in mm -hmm. the way you say something or suggest something or issues that you happen to raise. Um, because even, even as associate members, you're allowed to participate in the hearing. You're allowed to, to ask questions. And sometimes that uh, you, you might raise an issue that suddenly causes another member of your board to say, ah, yeah, he's right on that. I'm not going to approve this because he's absolutely right. This is not going to work. Um, you know, the other thing, too, is just generally the open meeting law doesn't make a distinction between a 
permanent voting member of a board versus an associate member of the board. You know, you are on that board and at any moment you might suddenly be impaneled because someone else has, uh, you know, an absence or a conflict of interest or something. So I would say always comport yourself as though you are a voting member of that board. Thank you. I see Ms. Greenbaum has a question. I know slightly tangential, but it has to do with site visits. And um, it happens to be one case that I was on this year that was withdrawn. But could not having a site visit impact in any way um, with a negative decision if it's somebody appealed? In yeah. other words, you're not required to have a site visit. You they are, can't hold it against you if nope, you vote. You, you are absolutely not required um, to have a site visit. And you know, depending upon the complexity of the application before you, there may be absolutely no need. Or you know, don't forget, you also you live in town. You might be very familiar with a particular project. Uh, you're not required to check all of that personal knowledge and familiarity at the door, you can still bring that to you um, as a board member. So no, there is no requirement that you have a site visit. It's just something that sometimes the circumstances may arise that it helps everyone visualize a project a little bit better. So, so the um, appellant can't go to court and say, well, you, you didn't come and look at the site. You don't really know what it looked like. They can't say that uh, and get away with it. Can they say that? Of course they can say that, but it's going to hold no weight because there's okay. no requirement. You know, it's um, it, it's a little bit different if, if if you had a bylaw that said, you know, as part of the, you know, this special permit process, you have to submit, you know, uh, stormwater calculations. And we just said, oh, never mind. We're not interested in stormwater calculations. This looks lovely. That's a problem. But the fact that you didn't come out to the site, you didn't walk the site, you didn't visit the site, you don't have to. You don't have to. That's exactly why you're relying upon um, engineers or peer reviewers to be your eyes and ears um, in, in that regard. Thank you. You're welcome. So I was just going to touch upon one last thing on the open meeting law and, then, and pivot over to the uh, conflict of interest statute. And, and that is just to let folks know um, about the enforcement component of this. I mentioned earlier that the attorney general enforces the open meeting law. Um, any member of the public could file an open meeting law complaint. Um, and they're supposed to file it with the board that allegedly committed the violation. Um, they're supposed to do that on a prescribed form from the attorney general's office. And it's supposed to be filed within 30 days of when they claim the violation occurred. Um, you as a board, your only real role should you receive an open meeting law complaint is um, you need to meet and discuss a response to the complaint. And that response has to be shared, has to be in writing. It has to be sent to the complainant. A copy also needs to be sent to the attorney general's office. And that has to be done within 14 business days of when the complaint comes in. So it may not always work with your normal meeting schedule. It might require that you call, call a special meeting uh, for the purpose of discussing the open meeting law complaint. Uh, I have you know, different boards that will roll their eyes at me as if to say, not again. Do we really have to do this again? Yes, we have to do this again, I'm afraid. Um, there, you know, the, the, the biggest thing that, that boards question when there is an open meeting law complaint is, well, so, so what if we did this? You know, like, for example, so what if we didn't approve our minutes in a timely manner? You know, what is the attorney general going to do? Well, in my experience, you know, the first, the first couple of infractions, it's a, you know, it's a slap on the wrist. It's a warning. It's a, they might compel the members to undergo open meeting law training um, and maybe even, you know, certify through an attendance sign in sheet that all of you attended this training and when. Um, they could, if this was a different context, you know, if you were, uh, if, if the violation was that somehow or other you voted on 
or took some sort of action with respect to an application that was in violation of the open meeting law, the attorney general could nullify your vote. Um, that doesn't happen very often. It happened not too long ago in Nantucket with a, a hiring decision that they made. Um, that was not something that went over particularly well with their planning board. So, um, but it is something that is within the attorney general's power to do. And the attorney general also has the ability to fine board members if they think there has been an intentional violation. So um, that again is, is, is not something that they do frequently. Uh, the fine is a thousand dollars. And I have seen the attorney general do it in some instances where they've said to a board, we've told you previously that this is a violation of the open meeting law and you've done exact, the exact same thing again. So I, I don't ever expect to hear about that from any of you folks, but just bear that in mind um, that that is always the, a possibility. Um, and one last thing, Chair, I know that we're all meeting here remotely and uh, you know, prior to COVID, this was just not something that we did um, and yet uh, to sort of accommodate folks in the COVID era, uh, we've gotten into remote meetings. And currently this is all at the, uh, as a result of legislative action allowing these kinds of meetings. Um, right now, remote meetings are set to expire in March of 2025. But I can tell you there is legislation that is pending to figure out uh, or to enact legislation to make remote meetings a permanent thing. Um, there are some logistics they need to work out, but um, you know, certainly in my experience of sitting through the 40B with you folks over the past several months, you've figured it out with very little glitches. So um, I don't think that's gonna be an issue, but if you ever do decide to go back into in-person meetings, well, then so be it. We, you know, um, now with that, I'm ready to move on to the conflict of interest law unless anybody has any one last lingering question about the open meeting law. And I think what's important here to, is to really focus on the conflicts that are likely to be, um, that likely the ZBA members, board members are gonna have to worry about, right? Exactly, so, exactly. Um, so the conflict of interest law, it, it, it's uh, chapter 268A. There are provisions that apply to state or county or, or municipal employees. Um, one question I get from a lot of board members is, well, I'm a board member, I'm not a municipal employee. The definition of a municipal employee is that it pertains to anyone, whether you are appointed or elected and whether you are compensated or uncompensated, you are considered an employee for the purposes of, that, of the statute. Um, the statute prohibits certain behavior as a municipal employee. Um, and the perhaps the most common ones, and I'll just hit upon those, is there's um, one concept that is called agency. You as a municipal employee cannot act as an agent for any other entity other than the town of Amherst, except in rather limited circumstances. So, um, if you were, and I will give you a real life example, but the town shall not be disclosed. Um, in another community, there was a chair of an economic development commission that somehow or other became the main uh, petitioner of a citizen's petition for a zoning amendment. And um, that chair of that economic development board went to the planning board and presented the zoning article to the planning board went to town meeting, presented that article to town meeting. All of that was a violation of the, uh, of the conflict of interest statute because in representing some other property owner's interest in that, you know, the, the town is considered to have an interest in all of its bylaws, including its zoning bylaws. And by representing someone else's interests, it was adverse to the town. And it, so th that's what it means to be acting as an agent for someone else in that regard. It is not, however, a conflict to represent your own personal interests. 
before another board. So if you, for example, are putting an addition on your house or you've got a business uh, or uh, perhaps you need site plan review or a special permit to do something like this, you are absolutely allowed to act on your own behalf. It's only when you are acting as an agent for someone else that you have to pause and recognize that you are absolutely prohibited from doing that. There are some exceptions for what we call a special municipal employee. I don't think that pertains to any of you here and that's going into the weeds that I don't think we need to go down right now. Probably the most um, prevalent type of conflict of interest that folks think about is a financial interest. Whether you or a member of your immediate family has a financial interest in some sort of business that comes before the town. Um, so in particular, as a zoning board member, if a member of your immediate family is applying for a variance, you should absolutely recuse yourself from having anything to do with that. And what do I mean by recuse? I mean, you get up from the table if we were actually sitting around a table or you would mute yourself and shut your video off on Zoom and the chair would make an announcement to say, member so-and-so is recusing himself, herself from this next application because of a conflict of interest. You don't have to go into detail as to the nature of the conflict of interest. It is enough that you have said, I identify that there is a conflict and therefore I am going to remove myself. Some folks seem to think that they can still sit at the table, even though they recuse themselves or some, you know, again, if we were meeting in person, uh, a board member might recuse themselves, get up from the table and then join the audience. You should not do that. You should literally leave the room, be it the actual room or the virtual room, because even your presence staying in the audience, um, one, is, is a level of participation, or it could have an appearance that by virtue of you being there, you are sending a message to your fellow board members in some way that you want them to vote in favor of or against a particular applicant. So if you're truly gonna recuse yourself, it is out the door, nothing to do with it. Folks will call you back into the room when that discussion is over. Um, and for financial interest, uh, the conflict of interest statute has a very low threshold. It is literally anything valued at $50 or more. So uh, we're not talking about, oh, well, you know, whether someone is a business partner, it could just be a, a pretty low bar for that uh, to be triggered. Um, the other thing that comes up is just generally, um, you know, who is a member of your immediate family? Um, it's your spouse. It's your spouse's parents, it's your children, and it's your brothers and sisters. It is not your aunt, it is not your uncle. Um, so there are certain degrees of separation, but again, um, be aware of that if, if uh, sort of an extended family member is going to come before you. And again, if the public knows that this is somebody who is a member of your family, but they may not know how many degrees of separation they are from you, it never hurts to make a disclosure at the start of the public hearing to say, uh, you know, for those of you who, who may know, uh, this applicant happens to be, you know, married to my second cousin. And I'm just disclosing that, but it is not a conflict of interest for me to participate in this should, should you choose to go ahead. That disclosure usually dispels any notion of some kind of impropriety on your part. Um, there's also something that's called the code of conduct in the conflict of interest statute um, that basically also talks about not only is it, we all know that for example, we know it's illegal to accept a bribe or to solicit a bribe. Not that any member of you are gonna do that, but you know we would all agree that that's clearly a violation. But it could also be a violation if you attempt 
or you do actually use your position for some sort of unwarranted privilege of substantial value that is not otherwise available to similarly situated individuals. So what do we mean by that? You know, someone, you've got a particular applicant that is coming before you that um, conducts a concert venue and there's a concert coming. I'll show my age of my daughter. Taylor Swift is coming and your daughter would make her, would just be the highlight of her year if you could get tickets to a sold out Taylor Swift show. And you kind of insinuate to this applicant that, gee, any way you could get me a deal on those Taylor Swift tickets? While that, that applicant has something pending before you, that's using your position to secure uh, a privilege or benefit that would not otherwise be available to someone else. Um, I often hear board members joke about things like that and I cringe because even though they're joking, I always wonder if there's someone out there who doesn't really see it as being particularly funny. So be careful of that. Um, the other thing that the code of conduct talks about is that a municipal employee should not act in a manner that would cause a reasonable person to conclude that the employee is acting with bias or favoritism or for other sort of personal reasons. So this kind of goes back to a little bit of what we were talking about before of, of you know, if, if folks see you congregating in the halls of town hall and chit chatting or to soccer game or something like that, folks might jump to a conclusion that might not be a correct one or a fair one, but they might jump to a conclusion about the nature of your conversation. Um, that's where the chair is saying, just stay away from people. Don't talk to people and don't even give anyone the opportunity to think for a moment that you might be having some kind of you know, improper conversation with an applicant off to the side. Keep it all in the context of the public hearing and um, you should never have any particular issue with this. I will say um, the conflict of interest law is a little bit more complicated than I have just uh, made it out to be. But a couple of things you should know is that number one, there is to the state ethics commission, there is an attorney of the day and you can call that number free of charge and you can tell them this is the situation. I'm not quite sure whether this is a, a conflict of interest, but I'm a member of the zoning board and I have this application before me, give them the facts and they, will um, give you either an informal or a formal opinion as to whether or not they think um, you could still participate in that particular matter. You can also reach out to us as town council as to whether or not you, you just wanna know, can I or can I not do this? Um, in both situations, reach out before the matter gets underway at your public hearing. It's a little too late once that public hearing is opened and you're sitting at the table, it's a little too late after the fact to say, oh gosh, maybe I shouldn't have done that. Um, you know, if you reach out to us as town council, um, again, we can give you an informal opinion you know, based on what you've represented as to whether or not we think, yes, it's a conflict and you should, you should recuse yourself. If you feel the need for a formal opinion on that, you should just be aware that if we had to give a formal written opinion, we are obligated to file that with the town clerk's office and a copy also has to go into the state ethics commission. So in my experience, most folks, they just want sort of a quick, what do you think? Yes, no, kind of a, a response. Sometimes you can give that, sometimes it requires a little bit more um, facts on the to, to really make that determination. There's also, if you go on the State Ethics Commission's website, there are forms that are called disclosures um, because sometimes there might be um, an appearance of a conflict of interest or there might be some type of a uh, 
a, a, rela a business or a familial relationship, but it isn't, it isn't of the right degree of, of familiar, you know, within the family circle, or perhaps you had a past business relationship and that business relationship was dissolved, but folks still think you might be involved with that business. In situations like that, we sometimes suggest that fill out a disclosure form. They're pre-printed forms. They're, they're pretty direct as to, you know, the, in, the nature of the information. But the idea of the disclosure form is you complete it, you then submit that either to your appointing authority or uh, it goes on file with the town clerk's office. If you make a disclosure and you are still going to participate in whatever the public matter is that you felt you had to disclose, I always recommend that folks make their disclosure known right at the start of that public hearing as well. And what's the purpose of that? It, it's dispelling the notion that there truly is a conflict because a disclosure is not, I have a conflict, but I'm gonna participate anyway. No, you have a conflict, you cannot participate. This is those shades of gray where it could have been a conflict or someone might construe it as a conflict, but it isn't truly a conflict. But I wanna be proactive and I wanna put it out there so that no one is questioning whether or not my vote was influenced by some sort of real or perceived relationship I might have with the applicant. Again, it's um, never a very simple thing to go through. So I would, I would suggest that if there's anything that comes up on the agenda that you have some concerns about, um, feel free to, you know, through Christine to, to reach out to us and, and ask, you know, do you think I should file a disclosure? And we can walk you through the proper form and all of that. So with that, I'll pause, Mr. Chair, and see if anyone's got any Did anybody have a question on that? I guess the one question people have that I hear a lot is, the property's next door, the property's abutting, I'm within 200 feet, um, what should I do? That is that is the kind of the most likely one. And you have both the situation where, well, that, what happens in that property may affect your property values by more than $50, um, one way or the other. Um, so just exactly. talk through that real briefly for us. Exactly. Steve. If if you are um, a direct abutter to an application that comes before you, or you own property um, that is either a direct abutter or one of those abutters to abutters within 300 feet of the subject property, you should absolutely recuse yourself from participating in that matter. And... It doesn't matter whether you are in favor of the particular application or you are opposed to it, or even if you're neutral, it doesn't really matter. The, 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 the point is that by virtue of owning property within that, you know, a butter to a butter within 300 feet sphere is an approval or a denial of that application certainly has an impact on what happens on the subject property, but it is presumed to also have an impact on your property, either in a positive effect or a negative effect. You know, so people always, you, you'll hear this if you haven't already, people will say, well, I'm concerned that if we approve this, my property value is going to go down. We may not know whether your property value does go down but it doesn't matter. We don't have to worry about whether your property value is going to go down by $50 or more. That's not the point. The point is simply that because you are within that sphere of an abutter or a butter to an abutter within 300 feet, it's presumed you have a financial interest in any decision the board makes. That is an absolute recuse yourself situation. And a good, and one of the things is that we give notices to abutters within 300 feet, I think, Ms. Brestrup, right? So if you get, if you get a notice saying that there's going to be this property and you're getting a notice from the town saying there's going to be a special permit on this property, that's, an, and you, and your property is, uh, and you are notified of that, recuse yourself. Don't, that, that's a, that's a no-go right there. Go, uh, Ms. Greenbaum. 
I just wanted to point out that I had a similar situation a couple of months ago where a member of my family owned a property that abutted one of the um that abutted the parcel that we were discussing for a special permit. And I called the Eternal General and they said to me, as long as you don't have a financial interest in that property, it's okay that I can serve. I don't have a conflict. And that seemed rather iffy to me. I think that would again go to, you've got to look at what is the definition of the immediate family and whether or not that relative is an immediate family member. But it does also go to what is the financial interest. You know, if you own property or you own property as a joint tenant with a spouse or you know, you're, you have a business entity, an LLC, and you're the manager of the LLC, you truly have a financial interest in whatever happens to that property. It may be a conflict of interest for me to, um, you know, participate in a matter where my brother is an applicant because he's a member of my uh, immediate family, but I don't have a financial interest in my brother's property. So you've got to take all of those elements into consideration. And then they and and it wasn't the applicant that was the relative; it was the abutter. Well, I think you know we're not going. Hill this probably make doesn't make sense to adjudicate that your special your specific situation, but you know it does point to the. The quick response you get from the ethics office, I've called several times, you get quick response from the ethics office, especially if you're able to do it a day or two before. They, get, they do get back to you and they, they, they ask you the right questions. And, and uh, I, so I would encourage people to seek that as your first stop because it's, it's really pretty good. You also have the ability to ask staff here and if they need to, they can refer you to, to KP for help. Well, they told me the same thing. So. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. Well, are there other questions? Well, if not, uh, Ms. Murray, thank you so much. That was um, very good. And it, and it shows, I think, just discretion is the best part of valor here for members of the board. If it's, if it creates an appearance, if it's, you, if you're in, don't get into a conversation, don't create the appearance and be rigorous about the conflicts of interest and we'll all be fine. We've not had real serious problems on the board and people are really good about disclosing and do it ahead of time. When, you, when you're asked about a hearing on, in three weeks, can you serve on that panel and the property, ask about the property and make sure that you don't have a conflict so we can find somebody else to sit on that panel. So that's, that, is, um, that would be very helpful. And I guess the last thing, I, I just want to, and you can add to this, Attorney Murray, if, if, you, if you need to. One of the things I want to make sure you under, that board members understand is our role. The, the, the um, zoning bylaw sets out what can and can't be done on property, how, what, how, what can, where buildings can be built, where additions can be added on, what are the site dimensions, what are the setbacks, what are the uses and what aren't the uses. But within that, there is, in that zoning bylaw, there's a way for things that don't precisely fit within that, with the zoning bylaw, that we are allowed to grant a special permit. That's what a special permit is. A special permit is a discretionary act on the part of our board to allow it a use or a siting of a building or something that isn't expressly permitted by the zoning bylaw. And that's where we have to make, and that's where the zoning bylaw says, if you're gonna make that decision, to allow something that's not expressly permitted in the zoning bylaw, you have to do the follow, make the following findings. Most of that's section 10.38. That's the most important one of our zoning bylaw. We have to make certain findings in order to, in order to be able to say, to exercise our judgment, which we are given, given the judgment that that makes sense to approve that special permit or to, it doesn't make sense, but our judgment is whether it does or doesn't make sense based on the findings we have to make under 10.38 or other findings in, in the zoning bylaw. And that that's the discretion that we're given. And it's, 
Not that we're making that law. It's not equity. It's not what we're looking out there saying, geez, my, my world, that really isn't right. We have to look to see what the bylaw allows us to do and the discretion that we're given in that bylaw and how we make our, how we make our decisions. And those really are based upon, we have to base those upon the findings. And that's why when we go through a special permit, I like to look at the, look at what's being proposed. We've discussed about conditions that we place on that. Those conditions that we place on it might affect the, our ability to make a finding. So we do, set the conditions, then we go through the findings and say, you know, we have made X, Y, and Z conditions. That means that we can meet the, meet the standards set under 10.381 for it doesn't disturb the neighbors or whatever, whatever the finding is. And therefore I can improve, I can make that finding and we go on in the special permit. So I guess the, what I'm saying here is that we don't make the law, we, we kind of interpret what there's allowed, but we don't enforce it either. We're not the we're not the, the housing commissioner, we're not the building inspector. What we are is taking a look at a request to do something that would not otherwise be allowed, but for the special permits that we're going that we're asked to grant and or variance or uh, other things. And I guess that's the best way I can I can describe it. Would you want to add anything to that, Attorney Murray? Should there be anything else that I should add to that? Or you wouldn't want to add to that to instruct our helpful to our new members? I, I think you've covered it. I, I think the only thing to emphasize is that, as you were saying, using the word discretion, you know, a special permit is absolutely a discretionary permit. There is no right to a special permit. Um, but I would also caution that, but be consistent. You know, so if there is you know, say a special permit for is required for a restaurant and the board has consistently granted a special permit for, you know, 10 restaurants and the 11th restaurant comes in along and you say, you know what, I'm a vegetarian and I don't really like your menu. You know, that's, <laughs> you know, you, yes, you have discretion to deny it, but you should always make sure that you're being consistent in how you're interpreting and applying the bylaw. Yeah, I think that's good advice. Mr. Varner. Oh, you're muted. Uh, general question. I am curious if being on the zoning board prohibits members from working to change specific zoning bylaws. And would that mean an IFREQ? For instance, if I supported a certain change in a zoning bylaw, would I have to recuse myself in the event of any um, conflict, you know, if, or would I be posing a conflict of interest to um, to participate in the, the zoning board um, in any way? So zoning amendments are going to come through or go through the planning board. They're the body that by state law has to have a public hearing and make a recommendation um, as to, and then of course it goes off to the town council. Um, if this was a citizen's petition to amend a zoning bylaw, you can absolutely sign off on that petition. You have a First Amendment right to petition your government. What you cannot do is act as an agent for somebody, okay. even though that that so so if there is a request to rezone this parcel of land from residence to commercial or um, expand uh, the uses that might be allowed so that say a commercial use of some sort might be allowed or prohibited in a zoning district. You as a zoning board member cannot appear before the planning board or the council and advocate for or against that zoning amendment. It, in all likelihood, it is not ever going to come before the zoning board of appeals um, as a, a, you know, just as the pure zoning amendment. I do know some planning boards, they like to um, do a presentation to the Zoning Board of Appeals about zoning amendments because they recognize that that's the other board that has to live with this zoning change. It might have some valuable input. It's a little different if it comes before the zoning board in that context that if this is, again, something that you are advocating for or you are a petitioner for, 
I would recommend in that situation that you not even participate in the zoning board discussion about it. Because again, it kind of, it goes to, are you using your position as a zoning board member to influence perhaps the votes of your other board members, either for or against something? And then certainly if you show up in front of the planning board on a zoning amendment, and again, whether you represent yourself as a zoning board member or we just know that you happen to be a zoning board member, it carries a certain amount of weight. You know, who are you acting on behalf of? Now, having said all of that, if it is a petition that affects just your property, you have a right to represent your own personal interests before any town board. So if you are looking to have property that you own rezoned from A to B, you could appear before the planning board and you could make that, um, you know, that presentation in favor of that zoning amendment. But that is really the limited circumstance. You've always got to think about, am I acting for myself or am I acting as an agent for someone else? And if it's on your own behalf, that's fine. Acting as an agent is prohibited. Great. Okay. Other questions? Ms. Greenbaum. This was along the same lines. And back in the 70s and the 80s, it was fairly common for the then chairman, Harriet Shapiro, of the zoning board to advocate to the planning board that we have run into certain ambiguities in the zoning bylaw which need to be fixed. And she would stand up and in, in uh, she would never vote for the article in town meeting, but she would advocate for it in town meeting. And that practice has sort of stopped. And you know, we're continually finding ambiguities in the zoning bylaw or contradictions even because there've been so many amendments over the last 50 years. So has this practice stopped because it's illegal or we, we just have other ways of doing it? In other words, can the zoning board ask the planning board to make certain changes because they're contradictory or ambigu ambiguous or something like that? So the answer to that again is it depends on who are you acting on behalf of? And if you're not acting on behalf of any particular property owner or any particular uh, family member, you yes, the zoning board can make suggestions like that to the planning board. I'll give you a, an example. Um, another town that I was that I do some land use work. Um, they had an ambiguity in terms of how do you determine they had a 35 foot high height restriction on structures in certain zoning districts, but they never really clarified how the height was to be measured. You know, is it pre-construction grade? Is it post-construction grade? Is it, you know, if you've got a property that has a slope to it, could I just say, well, it's only 35 feet in the front where the, where the slope is the least, or is it really a 50 foot high structure as measured from the back where the property drops off. So because that resulted in an awful lot of variances for height coming before the, the zoning board, the zoning board did say to the planning board, um, or they actually had a zoning bylaw working group, they said, we'd really like you to clarify the definition of height in your next go round of zoning amendments. That's perfectly fine. It had nothing to do with a particular application. It had nothing to do with any um, particular piece of property. That's perfectly fine for the zoning board to suggest if that is uh, something you're inclined to do. Great. Well, thank you, Attorney Murray. We appreciate it. Um, you're more than welcome to stay uh, and listen to the rest of this, but I suspect you may have other things you want to do. Um, no offense, I will, I will take my leave, Mr. Chair, but it was uh, <laughs> a pleasure to spend the evening with you folks. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Take care. You bet, bye-bye. We have a couple more things that I'd like to run through and I hope we can 
uh, end the meeting early. Uh, we, we always try to end it by 9 o'clock. We, we try to be as good as possible on that. A couple of quick things, uh, on the, and they're listed on the agenda. First, the public hearing versus the public meeting. We always have a public there are two different things. A public hearing is um, a place where we gather information from the applicant. There's questions asked by the board members of the applicant. The applicant can then respond to those questions. We then open it up to public comment. Public comment is given. That public comment is directed to the board, not to the applicant. And the applicant is given a chance to respond to that public comment if they so choose. We have one last chance for board members to ask questions of the applicant during that public hearing. After that process is done, we typically, in a special permit, we typically say we're going to move to a public meeting while keeping the public hearing open. And we move into the public meeting. The public meeting is generally not the time for public comment. We don't, we, we try to re reduce the amount of give and take between an applicant and the public meeting. That's for the board to make its decision to deliberate, for the board to ask questions, discuss among, amongst themselves, and then to go through the process of making our determinations of conditions, findings, and eventually whether we will or will not approve the, the special permit request. That's the two kinds of here, those are the two, that's the characteristics of the two types of meetings we have. Public hearings are noticed more, there's more, uh, you can help me with this, Chris, but there's more notice given for a public hearing than there is for a public meeting. And a public meeting, like we have tonight, is not generally going to be open for public comment. A pub, during a public hearing, we will always have public comment about that, about the matter before us. Those, that's the nature, of the, two, the nature of the two types of meetings we generally hold. And so public hearings are open, public and open for comment. Public meetings are generally discussion amongst board members, not exclusively, but they're generally discussion about board members, about between board members, and the chair has the ability to get public comment or comment from the applicant if the chair deems that it would be helpful to the, the deliberation of the board. Does that pretty much sum it up, Chris? Yeah, and um, the reason that uh, we recommend keeping the public hearing open while you're having your deliberation sec section is, um, there do does come a time sometimes when you need to get more information from the applicant. Um, and so having the public hearing open allows you to get more information from the applicant. If you had closed the public hearing, then you couldn't accept any more testimony. So that's in case you're wondering, that's why we do it that way. Yep. Good point. Um, the next item on the agenda, are the different kinds of applications and things that we get, things we see. The most com by far, the most common is a special permit. We've talked a little bit about that, and I think most people, the new members included, are aware of a special permit. That is where somebody is asking to do something that would, but for the special permit, would not be allowed, either to build or a use, that otherwise, but for the special permit, would not be permitted. It's discretionary. That's, I would say that's 95% of the, of the applications we seek that we have a public hearing on. The next is a variance. There are very few variances in Amherst. This just isn't something we see very often. To make a, I've, I think in my time on the board, there's been four or five variances um, that I have been on the panel for. A variance is very hard to get. The zoning bylaw is very specific. There are very, there are four, I think there's four specific factors that have to be met. They're very detailed. And it's difficult to get a variance in Amherst, and, under the, and it's designed that way by the zoning bylaw. So it's not a common thing. And the last is the administrative ruling. The building commissioner makes a ruling on something, an administrative matter. He, he makes it administratively, not an administrative matter. He makes the decision administratively. The person affected by that decision, or the applicant in this case, says, I don't like that. I'm going to go to the ZBA to appeal your decision. That I think there's only been one of those that I've seen, that I've served on. It's not very common. That's the third type of, of, of uh, matter that's before us. By far, the most common is a, a special permit. I guess the other thing is kind of a, a, a special permit-like thing, which is we've granted a special permit. There's been a change of ownership. 
change of the special permit requires that the change upon a change of ownership, the new owner has to come back and say, either I'm going to keep the same management plan or I'm going to change the management plan. And that comes before us in a special, in a public meeting and not a public, normally a public meeting and not a public hearing. And so that's another thing we get that's not a, it's not a new special permit, but it's from a special permit and we're, we're, cert, we're following the conditions, the conditions required that change that change of ownership or whatever the condition was. We come back to the board for a, at a public meeting for approval. So those are the type of, of actions that we take on a regular basis. Um, the applicant doesn't have to be present. If they have um, somebody that was, is representing them, they can just delegate that to somebody else. Um, but if the applicant doesn't show up and there's no representative, then we will <laughs> we'll have to continue the hearing to a later date. But typically we would have somebody that's, we've had that question before. You can, it doesn't have to be the applicant. It can be, the, it can be a representative. We've discussed the review and the acceptance of minutes. We've talked about that. Um, one of the things that we're striving for is to give more time for notice to you about site visits so that we can get it out in advance, so 10 days in advance, so that we can plan, you can plan your time better. We like to do, we've been doing these Tuesdays at five o'clock has been the most recent time, but we'll, the staff will work with you and work with all of us to try to figure out when is a good time for that specific site visit. But we're trying to do that ahead of time, not, not on a short notice, but gives enough time to figure that out and for you to adjust your schedule. It isn't always possible and there's a lot of work going on and we've had a turnover on staff. Um, and so they've really been, they've been working really hard to do this, but we're trying to have uh, more notice of that. The same thing with materials. I really believe that um, it's important that materials come to you ahead of time, that you get materials five to seven days ahead of time so you have time to read them, especially on big complicated applications. It is not fair to you or to the town or the board not to have sufficient time to be able to review and notice what's on the, on the matter. And if it's, a, if it's a serial offense from either a, an applicant or um, a representative, that constantly is coming at the last minute, I think I'm prepared to post, to continue that hearing until a later date. We all know that things come up at the last minute. It can happen. It can be in good faith. Something changed or, there's, or was, there was a, a reason that we didn't see this latest plan until two days before. But if it's something that happens all the time, I am inclined to, to continue that hearing until a later date so that the board has the time to consider the, to consider the material before it. And, um, and I think that's important, but we're trying to get, it's our goal to try to get that to you um, either electronically or by paper and electronically as far more, uh, makes more sense for most people to get that to you a week, five days to a week ahead of time. Um, and one last thing that I would, I would note, I, I think in running these meetings, it's best when an applicant is making a presentation, especially if we can keep the applicant to 15 or 20 minutes, to try to let them make their whole presentation. And unless it's a, a question of clarification of something they said, not, not a question of what do you, why are you doing that, but just what did you mean by that? Where, where is that, where is the, uh, the lot line on, on that piece, on that um, site plan, to let them go through and make the presentation and the way, to, and then ask questions after the presentation is done. And the way to do that, to make sure that you can ask your questions that come to you is to take notes during the meeting and take your questions down and take down your ideas of a possible condition. If you see something you say, you know, that's, that makes a lot of sense, but, we, but perhaps there ought to be a, 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 a vegetative barrier between, on that property that blocks the, the intrusion of light from headlamps. Write that down so that you remember it and, it's, and then bring it up at the appropriate time. Because once we get into a, a, um, an applicant's presentation, we start interrupting them, then it, the discussion can go off track very quickly. And we, they lose focus and all of a sudden we spend 45 minutes on something that 
probably didn't need to do, we didn't need to spend that much time. So I, and I can be the worst defender of this because I'll see something and I'll want clarification on it. And then there'll be other questions, but I tend to, I tend to think it's much more valuable to let the applicant make their presentation, only ask really necessary questions. And then we'll go through and give everybody a chance to ask questions of the applicant at, uh, at the appropriate time. And that's how I, I think it's the best way to run the meeting. Um, those are the things that I put that I had put on the agenda that I had thought we should talk about. Perhaps there's questions of either that either Mr. Alfeld or Mr. Barner have, or comments from current members regarding the the ZBA. Any kind of questions you have or comments you wish to make, and I would it would be a time for that. Mr. Barner. Oh, you're. Oh, we still can't hear you. There we go. A little unclear about uh, my role as an alternate. And yep. uh, should I be like on the bench all the time and attend all the meetings or just the meetings that I'm impaneled for? And if that's the case, what happens if somebody decides in the middle of a meeting, I have to recuse myself? Uh, and then I, uh, how do you do you? immediately choose an alternate. I, I don't understand how that substitution works. It's good. That's a really good question. So let's, your role, you're more than welcome to be at every, to, to, to be at every ZBA meeting, um, even if you aren't on the panel. You of course can do that. Um, you will, you will know if you're going to be on, if we know that there is somebody that can't either for, um, scheduling reasons or for conflict reasons, one of the regular members cannot serve, we will go to the alternate, the associate members and start asking them to, if they are able to serve. It isn't often that I've found that we discover a conflict in the middle of a consideration. Once the panel is formed, it's formed. And if it does happen that there is a conflict raised in that, um, that is realized by a member once they take, once the panel has begun, has started consideration, we're stuck with four members. That person has to be, um, has to recuse himself. We're stuck with four members on the panel. And we're not going to, we're not going to have somebody jump in, in the, once the panel has already been, been um, impaneled and, and chosen. You can, you can miss a meeting, one meeting, if your panel goes, if you're on the panel, and that panel goes to has two or three or four meetings because it's a complicated subject. You can miss one. You have to read all the material. You have to um, acknowledge that you've missed the meeting and that you've read all the material and you're brought up to speed. But you can miss just one meeting out of it if there's more than one meeting on that on that um, that subject matter. But I would say to you, John, you're not likely to be called in off the bench in the middle of the game. Okay. You won't be called in. There's going to be no sixth man. In, uh, <laughs> no sixth man. No John Havlicek for uh, um, in the ZBA. I, and I guess that's the other thing. All associate members, thank you for being on the bench. And one of the things I intend to do is to make sure one of my one of my roles is to is to set panels or to establish committees if we need to. And one of the things I want to do is to make sure that everybody on the ZBA has a, full members and associate members has a chance to, to participate. And there's going to be, you don't have to, we don't have to affirmatively try that. People's schedules get busy. They go on vacation. They have business conflict, uh, business scheduling conflicts. So there's always an opportunity to, um, to serve and we'll go out of our way to make sure that you, you do have the opportunity to serve, but it's not going to be hard because it's just there's a lot of stuff um, that we we have before us, and we're, we're just we're busy, and we're really really thankful that we have a full house, which we hadn't had for about a year and a half, and it's it's you'll you'll get enough work, believe me, I, you'll get enough. Ask David was on uh, was Mr. Sloviter was a associate member for two years. He saw a lot of work. Um, Ms. Greenbaum has been an associate member and has seen a lot of panels, so we can we can be assured you can be assured that we will use you. 
Mr. Meadows. I, I should say that Hilda does not fall asleep during regular panel meetings. <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. I, had... <laughs> I, I, I do have a comment that I have to make. Yep. I'm um, sorry. I should have turned the video. That's... <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. Hope. It's a long night. Yes. Go ahead. Um, the, the comment has to do with the fact that I, I, I still and have not received any invitation to this meeting from the town. Hmm. Um, it did not, nothing came through at all. And I'm realizing that I, I know that nothing came through last week until after the panel had, had begun about the last meeting. And I'm realizing now that I'm fairly certain that I, there are other things that I am not getting. I'm not getting agendas. I'm not getting, uh, I, there's a lot of other material that I do not believe I'm getting, which me, tells me that there are other members who are probably not getting it material also. I, I don't think you're just picking on me. I think this is, is something that's gotta be straightened out. Because otherwise, you know, it, it's hard to say how unprepared we, we might be. Last, usually I go to the town's website to get the information as to what the agenda is, what, uh, what material has been passed out, what, uh, what letters have come in, and that's recent. I know that there's been a lot of turnover, but it has been going on for a little longer than the turnover. So there... There are definitely problems within uh, the planning department. So, so we we were talking about this. <clears throat> Excuse me, we were talking about this. Uh, uh, Ms. Brestrup is going to take a look at it this week. Going to take a look at the distribution. Mr. Um, Henry had a, had one suggestion, but I, it seems that it's apparent that at least in your case and maybe in others, which we don't know because you wouldn't know that you didn't get something, right? Exactly. Um, <laughs> it's a negative. <laughs> don't know it's a negative, right? You don't know you didn't get it. Uh, <clears throat> we're going to look at that. And I think for our next meeting, we'll have, we can perhaps um, have a, an item in the, in the new business that will discuss um, if they've made some changes mm -hmm. or aren't able to solve the problem. But mm -hmm. it is, there's no reason that you shouldn't be getting the stuff and we'll, it should be solved. Ms. Presto. Yeah, I just want to make sure that everybody um, uses a consistent email address. And I think Mr. Meadows uses his CTI energy address. Is that correct? That's so we correct. should always send our yeah. emails to that address as opposed to, I think you have another address to maybe it's Comcast or something. So we will always send to the CTI. The other thing is that um, the invitations come from an individual. So when I get my invitation, it comes from one of our staff members. And so it comes from Pam Field Sadler or recently it might come from Jacinta Williams because she's joined us in the last six weeks. And mm -hmm. um, just to be aware to look for those names. If you see an email from Field Sadler or if you see an email from Williams, those are ones to grab onto. Um, mm -hmm. So we'll try to work with you to make sure that you get all of the email, but, um, you know, just you know, I'll, I'll try you know to think about why that, why things are not happening for you. You know, what make what may make sense, Ms. Brestrup, is to send out an email with the email addresses of everybody who they, we might be getting emails from you, Jacinta, Pam, and then people can put they can click on that, put it in their uh, contact uh, contacts, and then it becomes a um, you know a, a, a trusted address because maybe. Craig, maybe you're not seeing it because it's either blocked or it's ending up, is it ending up in junk or is it ending up in, is it filtered out by some, for some reason? No, I, that would I at least my... put it into the contact list and then it'd be a trusted name. Right. If that were so, I, I would be happy to have that happen, but it, it is not. It's not happening. Okay. No. I can well, tell you, Mr. Meadows, for tonight, I do not have your correct email on the list that was provided to me. So... I'm sending your email to comcast.net. So anything that was coming for, our, for tonight, including our last minute attempts to email you links, 
I was sending them to the wrong address. So that I can tell you is happening tonight. And I will reach out to make sure we have all your correct emails that you want us to use. Okay. okay. Let's check the, we'll check the Comcast, make sure that that's correct. Yeah. So you, yeah. Don't wanna have, you don't want to have it go to Comcast. You want to have it go to CTI. So, mm -hmm. But you can we, also have Comcast forward up to CTI. We could have it go to both, but the, res the email address that we received from on high <laughs> was the Comcast <laughs> address. Yeah. Yeah. So that's, this has been great conversation because we've narrowed down the problem very quickly. Thank you. Thank you. I, I like a resolution of a problem. Hopefully we just, mm -hmm. uh, who knows? Yep. Yep. Well, we double check that, you know, it's a good thing to do. Double check the emails for everybody. Yep. You can do that next week. That'd be, that'd be helpful. Great. Yeah. Um, any other questions or comments members or our new members have? I, this is a great time to do that. Questions about your role? Questions about access to staff? To staff anything? Okay. All right. As I said, normally we try to end these meet. We do try to end these meetings by nine o'clock. Um, you, you know, it may, if 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 it's in our judgment, my judgment, that we're really close and it's just going to take ten minutes or fifteen minutes to end the meeting, we'll go over. But if we're if we're likely to have a half hour to forty five minutes more of work on something, and it's up on nine o'clock, I'm going to move to. Um, I'm going to ask for a motion to continue the hearing to the next date because I I think that. For us, that's long enough. It's three hours of sitting and three hours of deliberating. Staff has to, they have lives to live at home after nine o'clock at night. And I just, I think it's the best way to do it. And we all always try to take a break. Um, so that's that's kind of our, our schedule. And we look forward to each and every one of you participating and uh, serving the town of Amherst and, as best you can. We really appreciate your work. I know I think it's important and I think you're going to find it fulfilling and satisfying. All right. Unless there's any, Yay. if there's any other questions, we'll move to the last order of business, which is uh, any other business not anticipated with the last 48 hours. And we don't have anything. I don't think we have a meeting next mm -hmm. week, Chris on, um, do we not? Is it two weeks? We have a meeting in two, two weeks. weeks. We have a meeting yeah. on the 27th. 27th and that's meeting. about Ron Laverdier's project on 395 West Street and Mathena Morrissey, 180 North Whitney, but the Mathena Morrissey one is going to be continued to July 11th. Got so it. really, it's just Ron Laverdier for, um, for June 27th. And I think we'll have Jen Mullins helping us with Zoom that night. But Great. <laughs> All right. Members. So there's no, no other, I have no other business. If anybody else has any other new business, it'd be a time to ask. Mr. Chair, so yes. given that the Whitney Street project is going to be continued, I'm on a panel for that one, and the Ron Frenier is new, I'll be fine if he's one of the alternates for that hearing so they can get some exposure. Um, if that's the only thing on the agenda for that evening. So were, were you on the panel for, you were on the panel for both of those already, I think, for Ron, we, that's where we walked the site on, and it was continued. And when we didn't he, have a hearing. It was continued, yes, we didn't have a hearing. Yeah. So we, we can't appoint somebody to take your place because it's our, the panel's already been started. Ah, okay. So the panel's been formed and, and we can't kind of, we, there's no John Havlicek here. In for the, the six man into the into the, the <laughs> panel, but I've really dated myself twice tonight. Dragnet and John Havlicek. Okay, <laughs> all right. If there's anything else anybody has, this would be the time to ask it. If not, I would entertain a motion to adjourn. So, so moved. moved. It's been moved <laughs> and seconded. Uh, there is no debate on the motion to adjourn, so the vote occurs on that motion. This is a vote of the regular members and it needs three to pass. The chair votes aye. Mr. White? Aye. Mr. Slobiter? Aye. Mr. Henry? Aye. Mr. Meadows? Aye. 
The motion is passed. The vote was five to nothing. We're adjourned. We'll see you all soon. Thank you again for your time tonight. <laughs> Thanks for everybody. Thanks. Thank it's you. a family resemblance in the Slovener household. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> what was that? There's a family <laughs> resemblance between you and your, your child. My, family, <laughs> my son, it's a 